Hi, I'm John Swetnam. I'm Chief Marketing Officer of the Canadian Museum of Nature. Uh, the museum's closed right now um, because of the COVID-19 situation. All of our employees are uh, out of the building, working at home, um, you tele you teleworking, I guess, with the exception of uh, we have some critical staff in to make sure that the, uh, the HVAC is right because we've got specimens in there, they gotta be kept properly. The security is right because, well, you know, we've got national treasures in our National Museum. Uh, and cleaning staff, because we got to keep the museum clean, uh, probably for obvious reasons. But uh, myself, I've got a special pass to get in there today so that we can do a virtual tour. So as our uh, microbe sign, our microbes exhibition also closed, now says, wash your hands. We are washing our hands. We're getting ourselves uh, ready and we're going to take you into the Canadian Museum of Nature today for a little tour. So welcome to the Canadian Museum of Nature. This is our beautiful castle. This is where we would have come in if we could have got in today. Um, and right here you'll see the plaque erected by the government commemorating the fact that Parliament was here from 1916 to 1920. And here we are, we're going to go in. Coming into the museum. And uh, here we are in the main atrium. As you can see, uh, beautiful tiled floors. Here we've got our quite famous moose. Uh, so our tiled mosaic moose. Um, this guy, he doesn't hide anything, uh, but I'll tell you. Uh, apparently in the 1950s and I think into the 1960s, they strategically placed a carpet over this guy um, so that he wouldn't be showing uh, his stuff, so to speak. <laughs> uh, but he's got great antlers. Uh, and as you come in here, normally, of course, this is very busy. We'd have, uh, you know, well, Thousands of people normally come to the museum every day, so normally this would be our lineup uh, and we would be uh, receiving people right here. Uh, today, I mean, it's very quiet. You can look up, uh, you can see the various uh, uh, balconies of the museum. So welcome to the Rotunda. Um, this is just a beautiful room. It's a beautiful space. But beyond that, uh, this room has just one heck of a history. and. Uh, I mean, every time I come here to work, sometimes I think about that. There's so much history in this building, but this room may be in particular. Because in February of 1916, uh, in the depths of the First World War, when frankly things weren't going that well, uh, Parliament burned down to the ground. Um, and the very next day, they moved Parliament down uh, to the, I guess, the only other facility that could really do the job in town. And that was right here in this room. Um, and this building, I mean this, well, this building served as Parliament, but this room served as the House of Commons from 1916 to 1920. And some very important bills were passed here. Um, you can imagine that that would be the throne, so the Speaker of the House was there. Sir Robert Borden, who was Prime Minister, would be right here um, as leader of the government. And Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who was a former Prime Minister at that time, but leader of the opposition during the First World War, would be right there. And within this room, Think of it, from 1916 to 1920, basically it was the turning of the tide and the winning of the First World War and it happened out of here. To do that, um, two very important bills were passed. One um, was conscription, very controversial. Uh, so otherwise known as the draft, I guess, but the conscription bill um, to enlist soldiers uh, to go and fight uh, in Europe in World War I. Um, so you can imagine how difficult that was and also passed in this room, uh, the Temporary War Measures Income Tax Act. Um, it's still with us, of course, so it wasn't that temporary. And it's not that popular now, maybe, but back then it was very popular uh, because people didn't want to see others profiting uh, from their sons going off to Europe and uh, dying for this country. Um, also passed in this room, women's right to vote in 1918. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of that is attributed to the whole different climate that was around our legislators at that time. They were in this building, there was public access, um, and there was a real groundswell uh, to give women the right to vote, it happened here. And because this is uh, the Museum of Natural History and Natural Sciences, I have to mention a fourth very important bill, uh, which is the Migratory Birds Convention, again passed here. Uh, in 1916. Now why would passing a bill to protect 
birds be a priority during a world war. Um, and the reason for that is really the shock of losing the passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeons went extinct. The last one died in captivity in 1913 and everybody was stunned. Um, and so it was a priority to protect these, so well, other species, and they passed the Migratory Birds Convention here. Very important bill, protected birds ever since, still in effect, passed right here in this room. That's right, we gotta scan in because the museum's closed. Uh, but here we are in the fossil gallery. Uh, this is Canada's first fossil gallery, opened in 1913. Um, and its claim to fame uh, is the uh, authenticity of our fossils. Over 80% of what you see are real fossils, um, which means that there's 20% which are casts. Uh, sometimes there's a reason for having casts though. Uh, and here we can see Displetosaurus. Um, he's a cousin of T-Rex. And if you look at his head, uh, that, uh, his skull here, that head, um, we actually have the original in the National Natural History Collection. Uh, but this one uh, right there, that's, that's a cast. Uh, and the reason for that is because a cast is much lighter. Um, if that were fossil, which is stone, that'd probably weigh, oh, I'm gonna guess, I don't know because I'm not the paleontologist, but I'm gonna say that'd be a thousand pounds. And you don't wanna have a thousand pounds of rock uh, hanging over some over visitors' heads. So, so this is actually a cast, but the rest of it, of course, is real. And as I said, the claim to fame of this gallery, which is a really a phenomenal um, a fossil gallery, is 80% real specimens. Now across from, uh, from uh, Despletosaurus, we have a chasmosaur, a horned dinosaur. Um, this one would be a plant eater, uh, unlike a meat eater, our good friend Despletosaurus. And we're gonna visit these guys a little later further back. We're gonna walk down to the dinosaur forest. And as we go, you can see that we've got a lot of horned dinosaurs. Uh, we have a scientific specialty in horned dinosaurs. But also, as we walk in here, ah, it's probably worth noting. If the House of Commons sat in the rotunda where it did, guess where the Senate sat when Parliament moved down here? Kid you not, truth is stranger than fiction. The Senate sat in the fossil gallery. Uh, so here we are, we're coming into the dinosaur forest. And uh, so first thing, uh, Obviously, these are models of dinosaurs. Uh, so the question is, well, okay, are these really what dinosaurs were like? And the answer to that is, yeah, these are scientific replicas. Um, the scientists have everything that they need um, from the fossil record to know that these are what the dinosaurs looked like, with the exception of one thing. Guess what the one thing might be? Color, you'd be right. Uh, the color is the one thing they had to guess at, so to speak. And I shouldn't say guess, because these are reptiles, so they base the color off what modern reptile colors are now. Uh, but that's the only part that maybe isn't truly authentic. The rest, they know. Um, and interestingly, uh, they even know things like the skin. And we'll take a look at that a little bit later. Uh, but fossil skin is really important. You can understand what these guys look like. Now, these are, disp these are Displetosaurus, uh, Displetosauri, I guess, right here. Um, and they are about to have the chasmosaurs, who we also saw on the way in. They're about to have the chasmosaurs for lunch, I guess. Okay, so this is one of the favorite Twitter shots in the museum for obvious reasons. So, so this is a Montosaurus, uh, which is actually Canada's first mounted dinosaur, mounted in 1913. Big dinosaur. Um, and, uh, you know, a really neat thing, and why I wanted to point this out, is we talked earlier about the, uh, the dinosaurs in the dinosaur forest and how they knew everything about them scientifically except for the color. But how do they know about the skin? And here you can see on Edmontosaurus's back, fossilized skin. Um, I think you also see some fossilized ligaments up there. Uh, but finding that kind of skin is so important because that's how they actually can tell what the dinosaurs looked like, not the color but the rest of it, what the skin looked like. So now we're in the, really the back of the fossil gallery. The fossil gallery talks about the whole biodiversity of the dinosaurs. Um, a very complex, you know, an unbelievable kind of robust species that disappears in extinction. And then it comes and tells us the story about the rise of the mammals 
and this is the rise of the whale right here. You'll see that 50 million years ago, the whale was something like a dog-like creature. Um, now it would have lived alongside water bodies and fed on marine life. And you can see that from 50 million years ago to about 40 million years ago, it evolves where its legs disappear, it moves into the water. You can see here it's probably half terrestrial, half aquatic and then becomes a fully aquatic creature up here, much larger as well, by the way, which is the predecessor to the whale. Okay, so we're walking up now. We're gonna head up to, uh, well, we're gonna head up first to the water gallery, I guess, uh, but then we're gonna check out the other galleries on the upper floors. You know, um, working at the museum, I pretty much always make the decision to walk the stairs uh, because, uh, well, not only does it help keep me fit, uh, but the elevators here are pretty slow. Uh, things are closed, so we'll have to scan in. Okay, yeah, we're still allowed our special access. Now, here's our great blue whale. Um, uh, inside the museum, she has a nickname, which is Tallulah. Uh, but this whale is a great blue. Um, and so she was beached in Newfoundland, found on a beach in Newfoundland. She was transported uh, to actually the National Capital Region here on a train and then buried for 10 years. Even after being buried for 10 years, they had a big job still to clean uh, blubber and flesh uh, off of the whale. Uh, you can still see marks where the oil is leaching out. And uh, every year at our cleaning blitz, uh, we cover the whale's um, skeleton with uh, what me as a marketing guy call handy wipes. Um, very popular right now, uh, and I'm sure our conservationists don't like me calling them handy wipes. But basically, she's covered um, in uh, in uh, pieces of, I guess, a parchment, uh, which is soaked, which leaches out even more oil. Now you can see um, that we have up here on her back uh, some of the vertebrae are clearly not originals. Uh, that's because they were missing. Uh, so this whale uh, will have died from a broken back. Um, one theory, which is on our, well, one theory, <laughs> we'll edit it later, right? Uh, one theory is that uh, she was hit by a ship, um, but the other theory, and the one that, um, that our biologists have said are probably more likely, is that she got jammed in pack ice and the ice actually came and crushed and broke her back. So the great blue whale is the world's largest animal ever, bigger than the dinosaurs. Now, this whale um, is an adolescent. If she were full grown, she'd be 50% bigger again. In other words, this is two thirds of a full size whale. Um, now, interestingly, uh, you'll remember uh, down, in the, uh, down in the early mammal section, uh, we looked at the evolution of a whale. So I'm gonna ask you, uh, now these, these are clearly not real uh, specimens, these pieces, but it is part of the real whale and we have the real pieces in the Nas National Natural History Collection. Uh, so my question is, guess what those are? And the answer is, those are the whale's hips. They're called vestigial hips and that's all that's left from an evolutionary perspective of the whale's whole hips and leg assembly. So what we saw downstairs were very diminished limbs. This is what that's become in a modern whale, vestigial hips. And one other thing, here you get this amazing view of the inside of the whale. Uh, so I like to call this the Geppetto and Pinocchio view, because uh, if you've seen Pinocchio and they end up in the whale, here's where Geppetto goes, Pinocchio, we're in the belly of a great blue whale. And that would be what it would be like. The museum, when it opened in 1912, originally had a great big stone tower on it uh, that is now, now that glass lantern is in its airspace. But in 1915, they had to take it down because it was leaning. And you can actually see what the lean is when you look at the gap between where the banister ends and the wall is. There it's what, maybe an inch and a half or so. But as you go up, we'll see as we go up, when you get to the top, the gap between the banister and the wall is many times that. So that's, that differential is what the lean was on the tower and still is the lean on our wall. So we're in the inside of the Queen's Lantern. 
It's absolutely beautiful, and you can see Luke Jerem's moon in all its glory right in the middle. Uh, as I said, this is the tower that's in the airspace of the old stone tower. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. You may have seen it as the dance floor on uh, Nature Nocturne Nights, or maybe, maybe you had your wedding here. Anyway, we'll look forward to having you back uh, when we get through this COVID crisis. Now we're gonna head into the uh, Mammal Gallery. Uh, again, the museum is closed. Uh, and we're here on a special pass. So, uh, yeah, our pass is still good. In we go. And the Mammal Gallery really displays all of Canada's iconic mammals uh, in their natural setting. And it does that with these beautiful dioramas. Uh, clearly, it's one of the more historical parts of the museum. Uh, these dioramas were created um, and painted uh, by Tolenius, an artist Tolenius. Um, it was installed in the 1930s to be the earliest ones, uh, running through the 1950s. Uh, but if you think back to that time, um, people wouldn't have had the income or the means, probably, uh, to really go and venture to Canada's national parks to see these wild animals in the live. Also, in those days, there wouldn't be like high production nature TV series or like, you know, big screen digital TVs. Uh, where you could watch a nature show and experience it. The way you got to experience really wild animals, wild mammals in their habitat was to come uh, here to the Museum of Nature, to the Museum of Natural History and see these. The investment in these was big. Um, so Tolenius uh, spent, he would go out and he would actually tent himself, like get behind a blind so that he could experience, for instance, these bison in the wild. And then there's a special technique where he would paint on these domed, it's a dome in here, uh, to get that broad horizon feeling. Uh, there's quite an investment in making these, and when they renovated the museum, it was a brilliant de decision uh, to keep these in place. Uh, they're just magnificent. I like to call them the TV sets of their time. Of course, they're much better than a TV set, but maybe more like the TV industry of their time, at least as far as the Nature Channel is concerned. And here they are. So talking about Canada's iconic mammals, these are the mountain sheep. And if you know or if you've ever seen mountain sheep, you know that these guys cling. They cling to almost sheer cliffs on the highest of the Rocky Mountains. They are amazing climbers. And interesting story. So in 2010, in June of 2010, literally just a month after the renovated Museum of Nature reopened, there was a 5.2 uh, Richter scale earthquake in Ottawa, enough that it kind of shook things up. Uh, and, uh, and the theory was uh, that if the museum hadn't been renovated and been rebuilt from the inside out in steel, it would have had structural damage. Now, as it turned out, the museum had no structural damage. Thank God it was renovated. But one thing did happen. And the only damage we had from that earthquake is these guys fell over. Truth is stranger than fiction. So this really is how I get my exercise at the museum. Okay, we're getting there. How much higher? And we're touching the moon. Okay, we're heading into Nature Live. Uh, and to the bird gallery. Now, interestingly, uh, before our uh, closure, we had been planning on moving Nature Live, uh, which is going to happen. It's going to move downstairs near butterflies. But um, I mean, that's all stopped now. But when the museum reopens, and we look forward to that day, uh, this will be a, a new space um, with uh, some special, uh, special treasures, uh, the biodiversity gallery on display. Uh, so this is the largest display of Canadian birds in the world. Um, and uh, it's laid out like a field guide. It's, it's quite impressive, actually. Uh, when you come in, we're just going to look at a couple of things. I think it's important that we look at the provincial birds. Um, here you have the birds of each province. Uh, and they go all the way across. Um, I thought it was important to point out the passenger pigeon. Um, we'd mentioned the passenger pigeon were in the rotunda. Uh, because that's where the House of Commons in 1916 uh, signed the Migratory Birds Convention. Um, and that was, of course, out of the shock of this bird, of which there were over 4 billion in North America 
being extinct. Um, and why did it go extinct? It went extinct because it lost a lot of habitat to agriculture. We're talking about the turn of the last century, so moving out of the, the 19th century into the 20th. Um, it lost a lot of its migratory routes to cities. Uh, cities and industrialization basically got in the way. And uh, of course then it was hunted, and it was overhunted. Uh, they flew in big flocks, uh, they were an easy hunt, an easy catch. Um, and it's not uh, by coincidence. You'll see its name en français, c'est Tourte Voyageuse. Uh, Tourte uh, was the uh, foundation of the name for Tourtière. Um, now made with pork, but in the old days, a Tourtière would have been made with a tort. Uh, so here we have the gray jay. Uh, nice little guy, right there. Um, and he is, or she is, uh, the 2017 Canada 150 nomination uh, from Royal Canadian Geographic or Canadian Geographic. Uh, for our national bird. Now, he's a little guy, so you kind of, shouldn't a national bird be a great big, you know, eagle or something? But apparently, the good things about this bird and why it should be the national bird is A, it lives all across Canada. I think it's only, only one province, I think PEI, you don't see a gray jay, but basically it's all across Canada. He's a tough little guy. He, he doesn't leave in the winter. He's here all the time. He's a true Canadian bird, and apparently he's good spirited and plucky. Sounds like a Canadian to me. So that's the Grey Jay. Here we are, we're making our way up in the museum. Uh, now we're just about to head into the Earth Gallery. But you know what? Interesting thing, we got to the Earth Gallery. Now remember, we're here on a special pass on a day when the museum is closed, when we've got this whole COVID-19 situation and self-isolation and everybody's at home and working from home and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I guess there are, one thing that has to happen while the museum is closed is we got to keep it clean. Um, that's why the whole museum uh, got, I'll say, fumigated, but it was a fog, I guess. It was a, an antibacterial fog that was run through here a few days ago. Uh, but they need to keep everything clean, and it appears that includes keeping the floors clean, because here we are at the Earth Gallery, and the sign says, Fresh Wax. Um, so they've redone the floor, they've made it all beautiful, they've probably cleaned it all up and put in new wax, but it means we can't get in. Um, so we can't get in. We thought we would get in behind the scenes, but we won't be able to do it. We won't be able to show you the moon rock, which is what I really wanted to show you. Uh, the world's oldest rock, because Canada has the world's oldest rock, the Acasta Ice. It comes from the Northwest Territories and we got one right in there. Uh, some absolutely beautiful specimens of gems um, and gold and silver uh, and of course the crystal giants. They're absolutely beautiful to me. They're nature's art. Anyway, it's all here and we won't see it today, but it's here uh, next time. Uh, we look forward to next time. Welcome to the Canada Goose Arctic Gallery. The Canada Goose Arctic Gallery really tells the story of the Canadian Arctic. The Arctic is 40% of Canada's landmass, yet few people get to go there. Um, and I think people have a lot of misperceptions about the Arctic and this gallery wants to show you what the real Arctic is about. It is not just a land of ice and snow. There's a lot of biodiversity and an awful lot of beauty. Okay, so here we are in Beyond Ice. Now, Beyond Ice is actually a sculpture. Um, underneath the ice, uh, there's steel, um, steel that's shaped in a sea ice when it gets forced up, broken up, so it stands like towers on top of the sea. And uh, so there's a sculpture of, of that um, that is underneath here. Uh, it's got tubing in it, and in the tubing, uh, they run glycol at about minus, minus 12, 12 degrees Celsius, so that uh, the air, the humidity in the air, uh, just freezes when it touches, it frosts up. And that's how you get these beautiful real ice. This is real ice surface um, on Beyond Ice. Uh, it was done in partnership with the National Film Board. So the National Film Board, when it's running, is projecting gorgeous images. Um, there's some animation uh, that was done by some northern animators uh, and some video also done up north of the real Arctic. Uh, you can see animals, you can see people. It, it all happens on here with a soundscape. Um, because of that, uh, this installation, Beyond Ice, uh, won the um, American Alliance for Museums, which is the largest museum association in the world. It won the gold medal. Uh, so we're walking into the main part of the Canada Goose Arctic Gallery now. 
through the anamorphosis, uh, which is a, uh, a beautiful painting as we're walking through on seven different surfaces. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some specimens from the Franklin Expedition. Um, now these specimens actually came from an encampment uh, where some of the sailors uh, tried to leave, the sh they did leave the ship, uh, and were trying to escape by land uh, or get back by land, um, sadly unsuccessfully. Uh, but here you can see um, the various uh, specimens uh, from their encampment, like a pipe, the sole of the shoe, um, a nail, uh, a fish hook, some buttons. Uh, different things um, from uh, you know, that expedition in the 1840s uh, up into the Arctic. There's, a, there's something I wanted to show you. We're going we're gonna to walk through the geography section now. Um, and we're going to go into the climate change section. Uh, this section really tells the story of how there has always been climate change in the Arctic. There was a much warmer past. It's changed over time, but now it is changing really in decades, almost years, as opposed to over thousands of years or millions of years. So you might be, inter <laughs> you might be wondering, why is there a camel in the Arctic gallery? And that's because one of our scientists Natalia Rachinsky uh, discovered fossil evidence of a camel in the high Arctic. Um, upon analysis, it's verified this is or was a camel, lived in the Arctic three and a half million years ago. It was uh, considerably, here you can kind of see it, kind of a woolly guy. And it was much larger, if you look here, uh, much larger than the modern camel. And our skeleton here is of a modern camel. But it's really interesting to think that the Arctic once had camels and that in fact camels originated in America and moved to Asia uh, over the land bridge uh, between Alaska and, the, and, the, and Russia. So one of the great features of the Canada Goose Arctic Gallery is the gallery within the gallery. Specifically, it's the Northern Voices Gallery. This is a space that the Canada Goose Arctic Gallery gives to Northern curators to basically do their own thing. Um, and the exhibition we have right now, which just opened last fall, it's called Killalukat. Um, and it is about the beluga whale harvest and about how the in Inuvialuit people um, live in harmony with the beluga whales and how they coexist in the north. So come on in, let's take a look. Here we are, we're inside Killalukat, and you can see how we have the, uh, uh, the beluga preparation area uh, set up here. Um, as well as a beluga smokehouse, the smokehouse itself. Uh, the Inuvialuit Inuvi people uh, have been doing the beluga harvest, of course, for centuries. It's an entirely sustainable harvest uh, that is done in conjunction with the Department of Fisheries. Okay, so we're gonna leave uh, Killalukat now and we're on our way out from the Canada Goose Arctic Gallery. We'll go through our Arctic Connection space, which is a classroom space. Uh, you must admit, it'd be a lot nicer to have school group classrooms in the actual gallery than a classroom. And of course, no visit is complete without stopping for the photo shoot with the polar bear. Okay, so we've pressed the button for the elevator. In the Canadian Museum of Nature, that can be a long wait. Uh, now you have to remember that when this building opened, it was 1912. Uh, so the idea of freight elevators for museums weren't really part of the picture. Uh, in the museum renovation, uh, they combined what is the freight elevator with the passenger elevator. It carries a lot, but it carries it slow. So come on in. And as you can see, this is a pretty big <laughs> elevator. I wasn't kidding. Now, you know, when we had uh, Music and Beyond come here and take over the museum for really, they just had music all over. They put a whole ensemble in this elevator. It sounded great. It was amazing. And in terms of freight, oh, I better press the button. In terms of freight, um, some of the freight that maybe was most important uh, are, of course, our exhibits. They come in here. That's why it's so big. Uh, uh, but also um, some of our artifacts. Uh, and if you think about the whale that we saw, the great blue whale, um, the jaw of the whale apparently just fit from this corner over to this corner uh, with about a centimeter to spare. So we're coming down to the, uh, the basement um, for two things actually. Uh, we're gonna check into the uh, administration area 
um, and take a look at the president's boardroom. And then we're gonna go down to butterflies a little later. This is actually the room where I had my job interview, thankfully successfully, because I love working here. And while I was having that job interview, I was looking at this picture. Isn't this fabulous? Now this is one of the designs for the museum that didn't happen. Check out that tower. Look at the crown on that. That's quite an ornate and beautiful crown. And of course, it would make sense if it's memorialized in Queen Victoria. Now this design didn't happen. Imagine if the tower had been there, maybe it would have been leaning even faster. We're going down to butterflies right now. Um, and so we're with Luke. Luke's gonna let us in. Uh, and obviously there's nobody here. It's just, uh, just us and the butterflies. Okay, great, thanks Luke. Here we go, here we go. Okay, after you, here we go. All right, so here we are in the butterfly house, in the solarium. You can see lots of blue morphos all around us. Um, so you can just take a little look around while we're here. Oh, they're beautiful. Yeah, well, we sure miss having these guys visited. Wow, they look super. Yeah, and you can't feel it, but the temperature in here, it's just a gorgeous, lovely, warm, it must be what, almost 30 degrees or something in here, 28 degrees and just beautiful. Oh, aren't these guys great? They're just super. <laughs> so the butterflies come from Costa Rica. Um, and I guess the Philippines. Um, there's about 30, I think 32 species of butterflies that we have in here. And uh, they come in their chrysalids and, uh, and we hang the, uh, the chrysalids on, a, on a, a bar. Um, and then they hatch as they would naturally. And once they come out, uh, then they fly around in here. They're really pretty, they're just great. With the museum closed under these very exceptional circumstances, um, we're glad that we were able to get an access pass to come in today and that we're able to show you around, uh, at least in camera, uh, the museum for this behind the scenes tour. Uh, we hope you stay well and stay safe. Uh, we'll look forward to welcoming you back so you can have a real tour for yourselves of our wonderful Canadian Museum of Nature when we open again, hopefully sometime very soon. We'll see you then and we look forward to it.